Good morning, Nancy. Good morning. Or good afternoon. Oh, you're right. I said good morning. You're right. Sorry. <laughs> Late actually gonna get coffee. <laughs> so good morning to me. Okay, well, hello everyone, and welcome to the NYC Builds Bio monthly member spotlight and networking event. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Nancy Kelly, and I serve on the steering committee and as a founding member of NYC Builds Bio. First, I would like to thank Turner Construction Company for presenting this afternoon. Turner is a North America-based international construction services company with a staff of 10,000 employees. Turner completes $12 billion of construction on 1,500 projects each year. The company has earned recognition for undertaking complex projects, fostering innovation, embracing emerging technologies, and making a difference for their clients, employees, and community. The New York, New Jersey business units respectively have a combined staff of more than 1,100 employees and complete $2.3 billion annually. Over the past 15 years, Turner has worked to advance the life science sector and foster innovation across the country and has led some of the most high profile and one of a kind projects, including the Rockefeller University River Campus, NYU Life Science Building, J Labs, Alexandria Center for Life Sciences, and others that you will hear more about today. Welcome to Charlie Whitney and his team who will tell us about these projects. I would like to thank the founding and corporate members of NYC Builds Bio who make all of our programming possible and welcome my co-founder, Mitch Simpler. Wanna say hello, Mitch? <laughs> so I would if I could unmute. Uh, first of all, thank you, Nancy, and, and uh, thank you all the members of the Turner team that's uh, presenting today. Um, it's a privilege to work with you all and uh, look forward to continuing working with you. And, uh, and I'm personally looking forward to see what, uh, what you're going to share with us today. So without further ado, um, Charlie, if you're taking the lead, please. And uh, great to see everyone. Great. Thank you, Mitch. And thank you, Nancy. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be here today. You know, it's really interesting about the numbers that you talked about, Nancy. Um, we consistently do about $2.3, $2.4 billion in the region. And last year during COVID, um, we maintained those numbers. It was a really remarkable effort. I'm going to say industry-wide and um, with the Turner team, but we managed to uh, put the same amount of work in place during COVID than we did the year before and what we're anticipating to do this year. So pretty, uh, pretty neat. Anyway, um, my name's Charlie Whitney. I'm vice president and general manager for Turner in New York. You're gonna hear later from my counterpart in New Jersey, Mark Romansky. Um, I've been here for 33 years, most of it in the life sciences and healthcare space. The life sciences market's had some interesting revolutions. Um, you know, the institutional side, uh, the, fan, the pharmaceutical side's been here for a very long time, but you know, a big part of what we talk about in this group is the commercial side. And that was a segment that largely didn't exist 20 years ago. So it makes you kind of wonder what, what, is the, uh, what does the next 20 years hold for us? I'm sure we're gonna see this go in some very interesting directions. Anyway, Turner has been in this space a lot longer than my 33 years here. Um, the diversity of clients within this product type is staggering. Uh, we've got industrial clients that includes government, higher ed, healthcare, 
pharmaceutical clients, including research and development, um, manufacturing, and then the commercial, which the, the new segment that we're really focusing on, base building conversions, um, new corn shell buildings designed to lease to tenants, and fit outs within these spaces, the new spaces and the existing spaces. It's really the, the breadth and depth of this is reaching the point now where we're starting to see specialization within the different product types within the subset of life sciences. Um, we're, uh, let's, go to, uh, let's go to the next slide. So in the last uh, 15 years, we've done well over 100 projects. We've been the number one lab builder off and on in the ENR magazine for the past several, uh, several years. And we've done over $10 billion of lab work since 2000. Just in the New York and New Jersey market, we've got well over 3 million built square, uh, um, square feet. And that ranges from, in, again, commercial to manufacturing to industrial. So pretty much in all of the product types in this small geography. Now, you, when you think about manufacturing, you tend to think a little bit out west and down south where you have more real estate. But the uh, breadth and depth of the work that happens in central Jersey it really is remarkable. And we're going to hear about a couple of those really interesting projects today by some people from our New Jersey group. Um, Let's go to the next slide, please. So around the country, we have 46 offices. This is just a, a handful of, of um, clients that we've worked for in the last couple of years. But the, our national presence uh, really helps us and it, helps our, it really helps our clients in, in several ways. Uh, a lot, we're very frequently asked to forecast industry trends and seeing the big picture, not just what's going on in the New York market is very beneficial. Um, it's always nice, you know, when people are building in New York, they want to know what's going on in, in other geographies, you know, what's happening on the West Coast, what are the, what, are, what trends are you seeing out there, is that something we think is going to be moving into the New York market. Um, when a client is looking to move into a new region, and they want to plant a flag in a new geography, then they have, a, you know, they've got established relationships that they can work with. Um, and lately, what we're seeing is we have a lot of national operators who want to plant a flag in New York, but they're really, I'm going to say for lack of a better term, they're kind of afraid of the New York market. So they want to meet with New York City developers and they want, they, we asked, we're asked frequently to help arrange these marriages. So you take the life sciences expertise and marry it with the New York developer um, expertise. Sometimes the reverse happens. Local companies want to expand out and we're able to recommend um, developers and designers in other markets as well. So it's a it's really a healthy relationship. And again, that national presence helps us provide value to our clients in a lot of ways that you wouldn't necessarily anticipate. Anyway, that's enough of a general introduction. We've got some great stuff today. We're going to give you a market outlook. We're going to lead off with that. And then we're going to follow up with a couple of case studies and some really interesting delivery methods and some really interesting products. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Atilio. want to go to the next slide i believe uh and yeah, just introduce the team i'm sorry sammy you gonna take this yeah so just um the team that's um with us today obviously uh charlie mark romanski um do we want to go around around the table here and get a quick introduction from from each of the uh, members presenting today go ahead sam yeah. Mark here. yeah so i'm sam battaglia i'm, um, I'm vice president pre-construction for our, our new york office of 28 years uh, with Turner and in the industry and been anchoring the uh, pre-construction uh, group here for over 20 years in our in our office. Mark? Mark. Hi, I'm Mark Romanski, uh, uh, Vice President and General Manager. I run uh, Turner's New Jersey office, similar, similar to Charlie, 33 years in the industry. Um, uh, at the end of the day, uh, have uh, oversight of New Jersey. Dana? My name is uh, Dana Worthing. I'm a pre-construction manager here in New Jersey with focusing on the life sciences and the healthcare markets. I've been with Turner for uh, nearly 18 years with 10, uh, the last 10 years being in the working in pre-construction. Tilio. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Tilio Rivetti um, with Turner. This is my 30th year. Uh, I'm the director of design of our Turner engineering group. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a few moments. 
Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Jim Folgia, construction executive in New Jersey, 30 years in the industry, and I've led many of our life science and design build projects in our New Jersey business unit. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Omer Liz. I'm from the New York business unit. Uh, been with Turner 16 years and 23 years uh, in the industry. Mainly worked on the life science projects. Uh, my recent one was the NYU Science. Great, so we're gonna kick it off here with the uh, market outlook section of the presentation. Um, we'll talk to you a little bit about what's happened in the past, what we predict for the future, and what's the current state of our, of our current market um, as it re uh, relates to material pricing and fluctuations that we're seeing. Can we, can we get to the next slide? Okay, so we have a publication at Turner called the Turner Index. Um, it's posted on turnerconstruction.com. So if you went on our website, and at the top of the website, you will see a, um, a cost index link that you, you can have access to this index. It's been tracked for 100 years. And basically what we do, um, we take a regional approach to understanding uh, the current, you know, the current state. And um, we use an indice methodology to understand the uh, percent increase or decrease that we experience from quarter to quarter. We look at labor, material, overhead and profit, and current, and current market conditions. Um, what we've experienced from uh, 2019 was, uh, you know, we were in a robust market, as, as we all know. Um, and we were up around 5% in escalation regionally around, around the country. And in our backyard here in New York, um, we were close to that, maybe a little less, less than 5% mark for the year. But I would say we were at least 4 to 5% in escalation in 2019. Um, we, the trend was, was consistent into the first quarter of 2020 until the pandemic uh, hit, obviously. So from, um, from 2020 into 20, um, all of 2020 into current state, where, where currently what we're seeing is a, a decline of about 1.43%. In fact, all of the balance of 2020 was pretty flat after the third quarter. We were seeing a constant decline as it relates to projects either, either being stopped RFPs coming through the door and future opportunities were few and far between. Only select projects that had funding in place were continuing into design. Most of the bid projects, state infrastructure, um, federal projects were sort of put on hold. And obviously our emphasis was on the health and well being of, of our people and our country. Um, for the first time, we saw a tenth, less than a tenth of a percent increase into the four, first quarter of uh, 2021. Um, and that's, you know, we are seeing some current activity in the marketplace, but I wanna turn it over to uh, Attilio to really talk about why that is, you know, what was suppressed in the market and what was, what's increased, what has increased in, in, our, in our market. Thanks, Sam. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. So, um, over the last all over the last several months, we've heard a lot of discussion about material increases in, in the industry, or actually material shortages. Um, believe it or not, these increases have been going on for several months now. Um, we've we've seen these increases happening since about August timeframe and just carrying through. We've seen the biggest impacts though recently because the material shortages. Um, is leading to lead time impacts and, and that's being brought right to the surface on a lot of the projects today where maybe steel is taking longer to get to the site or a curtain wall or other materials are taking longer to get to the site. But it, items like steel, we've seen tremendous increases in the cost of the material for steel as well as the lead times. That's, that's directly um, uh, related back to the scrap steel pricing increasing and that's related to the availability of scrap steel. So all of these pieces start tying together. Um, and, and we've seen these increases over, like I said, over several months now, since dating back to about August timeframe, um, some even further back. Um, some of the facility protocols um, have impacted uh, the lead times as well um, for the fabrication also of steel. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, copper as well. Um, 
you know, those of you that, uh, you know, you follow some of these commodities a little bit, um, like myself, I, I wake up each day and I look up what's copper doing and what's steel doing, what's things like that. And copper is one of those materials that um, if you looked at its history over several years, you would find that it, it, it has steep spikes in, 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 in both directions. So it goes up 5, 10, 15 percent and then drops back down. Well, that's not what we that's not what we've been seeing um, over the past um, almost the past year now with copper. Um, it's just continually increasing and that impacts a lot of different things. Obviously it impacts copper wire, it impacts piping, it impacts several other materials um, associated with it. So what are the issues there? Um, really uh, some of the uh, tightening of the markets or the mines I should say in Chile and Peru, um, exports being down quite a bit. Um, that's one of the bigger, you know, that's one of the bigger issues. We are seeing a lot of projects steering towards copper or steering towards electric, I should say, um, utilizing even more copper on those projects. So those are things that are, that are happening and, and um, um, that we've been seeing that's causing that. So um, that is something, again, that we're starting to see stabilized, maybe even start to drop off a little bit. And we're expecting that to begin to settle down over the next quarter or two. And then the, the next slide, please. So I wanna share this with you. So you know, a lot of times, like I've said, we've been seeing these increases since midsummer, um, but we, it hasn't really been that uh, prominent in the marketplace until the lead time started impacting the project and everyone started waving flags saying, what's going on, what's going on? Um, and what we're able to show is what, what's been happening in the marketplace, the uh, material shortages and then the impacts of costs and things like that. Well, but what's happened at the, at the project side or bidding side, I should say, um, no one has really noticed this because we've seen such an increase in materials over this time frame, um, like I said before, we've seen steel raw materials even double in some of the types of steel. Um, but from a bidding standpoint, we've seen the market relatively flat. Um, those costs, those material costs, have been absorbed over the several months that have passed. You know, the the subcontractors and the vendors in the marketplace. They're, you know, they're looking at the, at the market trying to secure backlog for 2021, 2022. Um, in all of the, all the publications that we look at, you know, AIA and things like that, the billing index all said, you know, it's kind of flat or it's kind of down. And so people were looking at it as there's a lot of uncertainty in the marketplace. Let's secure work. So as the materials continue to increase, the subcontractor and vendor market continued to be aggressive. So at the end of the day, we saw a relatively flat market. The issue there is, is that's not sustainable. Um, we've seen uh, material increases on average across various materials of, this is about 10.7. It's up to about 12% today. Um, the market conditions that we look at with subcontractors is about 20%. So there's not much room left there for these increases to be absorbed. So, so um, it's very difficult for this to be sustainable over a much longer period of time. So it's something to look at. The good thing is we are starting to see the materials uh, starting to level off. And, you know, the, the, the hope uh, with all these uh, vaccines that are out there today, that it'll take some pressure off of the production side of things and help with the material prices, help get the materials here so there's not the shortages and we can get them out to the site so we don't see those increases. So that's, that's kind of what we're seeing in the marketplace right now. Um, this material issue has been a big issue. It, it's been highlighted definitely over the last two months, but it's been out there for several months now, for over six or seven months, as you can see uh, from here. Next slide, please. So to wrap up the the the, the, the outlook um, of, of the market from what uh, Attilio said is that you know towards the end of this year what do we expect 
we do expect the market to come back um, stronger and stronger as the material prices start to decrease, overhand profits start to in increase, and you know more opportunities come through the door. So by the end of this year, we could see anywhere from a half a point to you know uh, a point in um, from where we stand today, and maybe you know being down roughly one percent. You know we continue to see a flat market, and then into 22, we we should start seeing increases back to the uh, impacts to our into our projects. Uh, from here, we'd like to really get into the case studies, um, which I think are the bread and butter of, um, of the presentation. Great, so if you can hit the next slide, thank you. So the first product we wanna to talk to you about is uh, cellularity, uh, which was the conversion of an existing 150,000 square foot steel framed office building into a GMP manufacturing facility. Uh, the final project was a mix of uh, 40,000 qualified GMP space, 35,000 support space, and about 75,000 square feet of office. Uh, we had the opportunity to be involved at this project from literally day one when we sat down at our first meeting with the client and our design build partners to evaluate project feasibility and assist in site selection. Having the opportunity to be involved that early in the process was really a major key to the overall success of the, uh, of the project, both keeping it on budget and on time within the owner's time frame. The project went from how can we expand manufacturing to a turned over GMP validated space in less than one year, including the design. Uh, during pre-construction, I was able to provide baseline budgeting based on nothing more than a few block diagrams and, and a few meetings with the, the client and end users. Uh, through diligence and, and the partnership with our team, we were able to provide cost certainty through target value design from this initial baseline through the delivery of a guaranteed maximum price. At the end of the day, uh, the project had a savings of about 6% from that, that day one concept, right? So from, from block diagrams to, to final price, there really was uh, uh, early delivery of cost certainty. Uh, and one factor that really played uh, a part in this was the design build relationship and the constant integration of our pre-construction team uh, throughout every phase of the design. Uh, by sitting at the table during design meetings, our entire team was able to provide valuable feedback and suggestions for the design that would be uh, integrated directly into the drawings. We had roundtable discussions with the uh, with uh, designers, builder, and our, was able to give real time budget uh, implications, which really let the team make decisions on the spot. This methodology allowed our team to go from our day one kickoff in January to concept drawings in March and construction drawings in May, and it would not have been possible without that that continual integration of the entire team. Another key uh, to the success of that project uh, was, was budget uh, in, in budget certainty was the integration of our Turner Engineering Group. Uh, TEG is a division of Turner uh, that was started about 10 years ago as a way to provide enhanced value to our clients. Uh, they're a group of engineers and design specialists who work with their peers, right, the designers, but they see things through the lens of a builder. Uh, at Cellularity, the Turner Engineering Group was able to work with our structural engineer on the required structural reinforcements for this office building, um, which originally had a projected uh, reinforcement of 20 individual uh, column footings, and we were able to bring that number down to four. Uh, by right-sizing that design, it really helped us keep this project on budget and in alignment with our targeted value. Uh, if you can flip to the next slide. We have some, some additional photos, photos of the space. And then uh, just flip one more, please. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jim, who's gonna talk more about our aggressive schedule and how we achieve both schedule and quality. Yeah, th thanks, Dana. Um, what, what a great story at Cellularity, right? It's a, Cellularity was a spinoff of Cellgene and they too were seeking another CAR-T indication and treatment uh, location for their clinical manufacturing. and. Just like in most of the life sciences uh, projects, the value proposition is speed to market, right? So 
what did, how did the team model that? Well, how did the team pursue that in a design build fashion? You know, Dana mentioned that we took an office building. Uh, trend in the industry is to take some of these existing spaces and turn them into laboratories. It is not ideal, right? You do not see these mechanical interstitial spaces that you see in true laboratory construction. So uh, it's not easy to repurpose spaces like this. Um, how do we do it? Full engagement uh, and an all in commitment to speed and decision making. I mean, our client had a yes and no button, right? To the, to the extent that Dana described the decisions on the spot, they were truly on the spot. Uh, you know, uh, constraint management, last planner and pull planning, managing our, our percent plan complete, really, and really respect for the worker to, to get the best out of our team. And some incredible things happened there, right? We, from February to May, we produced a full set a full set of phase one design documents for permit. It's unprecedented speed. Uh, in, lab, in the lab space, right, what is, what is one of the main drivers, right? Air changes per hour, right? So with just a conceptual set of specifications that were issued to us in March, right? Our source blue group at Turner was able to leverage its contacts in the industry. And by April 30th, we had approved set of shop drawings. By July 4th weekend, there were 10 air handling units sitting in the parking lot waiting to be picked by a crane. Extraordinary. I mentioned no interstitial spaces. What did the team do day one? We laser scanned the entire facility. And we took that point cloud and built it into our coordination model. And that yielded zero, zero coordination hits in the field, which is, you know, doesn't happen on projects, right? In terms of quality, I mean, we are building a GMP space, so quality has to be documented. We have to work in hand in hand with the validation agent. And at that speed, it can be easy to make a mistake, right? Uh, product is going into walls and walls are getting inspected and closed really fast. So uh, we leveraged the Trimble technology and we were able to overlay the model uh, onto the work in place to make sure there were no deviations from, from the coordinated model. And that was just extraordinary tool to see to see our work in place in compliance with, with how, how we planned it. And it's a, actually a great sales tool for our clients to see how the space is gonna turn out. And so in the end, right, you know, we took uh, a meeting in January to fully validate its space in December. And we did it with Last Planner, we did it with Lean, we did it with Active Caring. The client dubbed our team the dream team, if anyone remembers the, the Olympic teams in the past, uh, you know, steel footings to validate space is something that we just didn't have a, a metric for. And, and we set the bar to uh, you know, great heights. Uh, the project had garnered great recognition with the ACEC award and with two uh, DBIA uh, meritorious recognitions. And that contingency that Dana talked about, right now our client is used, that we save for the project, our client's using it to, to put a new chiller in the space. So great stuff. Great story at Cellularity. If you could go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, another project we want to just highlight for you is the uh, Celgene CAR-T project. Uh, the Celgene project was a complete demolition and, and fit out of two floors in an existing facility. And a common theme you're going to hear about, this project's main focus was speed to market. Uh, we were, um, if you go to the next slide, please. Right, this is a, a brief timeline of our project. So in July, you see there, we had a single floor plan where we were able to once again, uh, establish a project budget based on no more information than, than really what you see on that drawing and uh, secure funding for the project, which was ultimately completed in December of that same year. Uh, a key to success for this traditionally structured project, right, where the owner hires both the GC and the Turner as the, uh, sorry, hires the design team and hires Turner as the GC separately, was the selection and collaboration with our key subcontractor partners. Uh, the only way to generate the speed that was needed for this project was early integration of design assist partners. Um, design assist can be a scary proposition to some, but we were able on this project to collaboratively uh, design a bidding environment that was a combination of both qualitative and quantitative metrics. On this way, we were able to leverage the knowledge and, and experience of our installers to, to help streamline the design. And at the same time, 
uh, our subcontractors had some skin in the game from the get-go, right, which was part of the, the quantitative analysis that was done uh, during the, the competitive bidding. One specific example was our lab casework vendors. Uh, lead times in the lab casework market can be very volatile, and typically it's one of our longer lead time items that we need to uh, address. Um, each vendor typically has some proprietary pieces and design parameters that really can cause some waste in the design when a manufacturer is selected that's different from the base of design on the drawings. Um, what we wanted to do in our pre through our pre-construction process was uh, evaluate multiple lab casework manufacturers on different parameters, including price points, uh, future versatility of their materials, and most importantly, really lock in the lead times before the design was completed. Uh, a collaborative team of, of Turner and our designers and, and the end users in this case met with all the lab casework manufacturers uh, and we were able to select a vendor uh, based on a competitive environment and our designer at that time was able to proceed with the design based on the specifics of that vendor, which really saved us valuable time in the design process. At the same time, as I mentioned, the, sub, the vendor had some skin in the game and, and really was locked into some, some pricing points, which uh, made sure that we, they were being held to a pricing standard. Um, right, with this uh, extremely aggressive schedule that we had at CAR-T, Jim is going to show us how uh, we leveraged not only our tools, but the project mission to get from where you see in July to where we were in December. Great stuff, Dana. So Celgene came to us in April of that year and said, hey, we've got a, a CAR-T indication that's, that's going to get through clinical trials and we need, we, need, uh, we need clinical manufacturing space. And this treatment was for um, a strain of multiple myeloma, uh, and you know, really groundbreaking. So there was an urgency assigned to the project that even superseded the normal need for speed to the market. And I will say that to the person on the project, that mission pervaded, and I'll tell you a little bit about that later. But uh, whereas we delivered in a design build fashion at, at Cellularities, Celgene was more of an integrated design solution with the contractor and designer, you know, Turner, uh, showing up at the same time, and you know, a heavy component of design systems, as Dana described. Um, what did that yield, right? Uh, we went to the town with, with really hand-drawn demo drawings, right? And the, and the town and Celgene had great relationships, so we told them about the project. Um, we demoed the entire interstitial space of the, of, of the facility in one month. So we took out every existing piece of pipe and every existing air handler in one month. From August to December, we delivered from new work to December, uh, we delivered uh, a complete uh, 80,000 square foot GMP space with quality labs, right? So along the way, what, what happened? Celgene halfway through the project changed their product, right? The CAR T deliverable changed and the lab usages and the people in the labs changed. And we had to change the program midstream, incredible. Um, design drawings and shop drawings, no kidding, were in the field being signed off and validated with the engineer and with drafters um, in real time because we didn't have time to laser scan and we didn't have time to, to as built. We had one and a quarter inches of structure tolerance to, to boom in the 10 new air handlers that we, we developed for the lab space. Um, when we turned it over, it was the largest facility of its kind in the, uh, in, in the country. We were drawing casework drawings uh, at the site. For, in August, we started uh, the quote-unquote design of the floor plans. At the end of August, product was released for fabrication. December 1st, the product landed on the project. And, you know, these were, these were, clean rooms with fully cleanable panels. This wasn't epoxy paint. So there was welding in the rooms and just an incredibly you know, dexterous set of labor responsibilities that we had to meet for their quality standard. The first piece of ductwork, this is, this is incredible. The first piece of ductwork landed on the job October 8th. I was just looking at the, the work plans from, from the year and we turned it over on 1231. We were building a facility you know, for people that weren't even hired yet by Celgene. 
our last planner, uh, uh, percent plan to complete, you know, our, how, how did we do with our plan for the day? Peaked at 94%. With all of that, we also had 290,000 hours accumulated without a single recordable incident, let alone lost time. A single recordable incident is part of our overall 1.3 million hours on the campus without a lost time incident. So something, we went very fast, but we went safely. So that's sort of the technical side of the story, but I, I must share the rest of the story, right? So we talked about the mission and day one, we decided that we called the project Building the Cure. Everyone, we ordered 500 t-shirts that day. Everyone that walked in the facility that did work, every craftsperson got a t-shirt. And the power of the mission, if I could show you some of the other pictures of 200 crafts workers riveted with us talking about what this project means for, for cancer research, you wouldn't believe it. We had regular work uh, lunches for the workers. Um, the, the worker satisfaction quotient was very high. In the, at the end of the project, we had a carnival for the workers and their families. We signed a banner. We turned over engraved hammers and, and really it culminated the turnover of the building when Emily Whitehead's father, Emily Whitehead was the first patient to ever receive a CAR-T treatment. Emily Whitehead's father came and spoke and thanked 500 people for their work at the facility and there wasn't, wasn't a dry eye in the house. It was an incredibly moving moment. And you know that kind of, you know, it shows the power of the mission, right? We can do the work, but if we're doing the work with a purpose, uh, unprecedented feats can be accomplished. And, and to this day, we're doing uh, phase five in the facility. So we're, we're still doing the quality work to this day for, for the Celgene BMS campus. So amazing project. If you'd uh, advance the slide. Um, I'm gonna talk about the NYU Science uh, Building. What a success story. Um, so I see some of our partners here on the call uh, from JBMB, LPE, but this was a great project for everybody. It was a great collaboration by every, everyone. And then this, this project is in the uh, Langdon Medical Center uh, campus. It's on the 30th Street and FDR service road. And this project has pretty much like everything. It was a ground up uh, construction, uh, 365,000 square feet. It has uh, uh, 45,000 square feet of uh, a vivarium, 10 floors of uh, wet and dry laps, ESL uh, three suites, we got animal holding rooms in every floor, and we got aquatic labs, uh, bird labs, and and then it, it was pretty much like everything that you you can imagine on a, a life science projects. This project contains them all, and it was a great success story for everyone. Even though we bought uh, we got the award of the best uh, life science project of that year from uh, uh, from ENR that year in that region. So that was that was a great success. Uh, it was a lead platinum uh, project. As you can see, the design teams were um, um, JBMB on the uh, MEP side, ENIAD on the architectures, and LPE for the owner's representative. So we started this project in 2011. And as we were uh, dealing with the schematic design, um, the Sandy, Super Sandy uh, hit the campus. The entire campus was underwater. And then the, uh, the labs the next door on uh, Skirville they lost 20 years worth of uh, their research under the water. So at that time, we went back onto the drawing board with the design team and us, and then we came up with a new design that you know we moved all of our vivarium and very critical services above the DFE line. So we ended up uh, fortifying all the walls uh, with flood walls. And we ended up adding uh, some automated uh, barriers. And also for additional uh, resiliency, um, we ended up uh, raising all of the MEP systems above the DIP line. And one of the unique things also we came up with was um, we start getting the utilities from the NYU's campus core generation facility. And that was a, quite a task by everyone because if you guys know the Langone uh, Medical Center, and it has a lot of old buildings and every building is occupied. So bringing the utilities from the energy building to a science project was a, quite a challenge. I mean, we came up with some crazy ideas and even though when we presented that to NYU uh, and it was, uh, it, we got their attention. 
But one of the crazy things that we've done is actually we closed their main lobby and at night we removed the storefront and we drove 55 ton crane through the main lobby to bring the piping and the support framing for these uh, utilities and drove the crane back to the street and closed the uh, lobby and then opened the lobby for public at five o'clock in the morning. So that was a quite challenge for all of us. So we started this project and we had problems in the um, uh, foundations because we're right next to uh, uh, the uh, uh, East River dewatering and we had rocks and we spent about 13, um, 13 months in the foundations. But we ended up finishing the job ahead of schedule, which was 39 months, including 365,000 square feet of a corn shell and all fit out for every, uh, uh, every lab. And so that was a great uh, success. Can we go to the next slide? Um, these are the pictures uh, from, uh, from the building. The one on the left is you see a, a lobby and our typical lab. Uh, you'll see with the chilled uh, beams um, throughout and then uh, flexible um, uh, casework design with the service panels. Um, what I wanna talk about is what Charlie mentioned uh, before is the difference between institutional life sciences and then commercial uh, life sciences. As you see it, the finishes are very high end on this uh, project. Since this was the institutional, their goal is trying to recruit the top of the top uh, and recruit the best scientists so they can be a, a Nobel Prize contenders and they can publish a um, bunch of things so that they can bring the reputation to the institutions. In terms of the other commercial side of it, you will not see this kind of finishes and you'll see a lot less um, uh, high-end stuff and then a very basic stuff for the uh, incubators to come in and then uh, rent the space. And as far as also the, um, uh, these buildings, you see a very high-end uh, curtain wall systems. I mean, you can see uh, some of the curtain wall systems, uh, they're going almost like uh, $200 per square foot versus the conventional uh, or commercial uh, um, buildings, they're usually in the uh, low hundreds. Um, and also one of the, th uh, differences you see in these kind of buildings is like this building had a, a, a full kitchen with a, with a cafeteria, a lot of collaboration spaces. As you see it uh, on the left side, you see a, a, a lunch space. The goal is uh, to bring all the scientists into one area so they can have more interaction between themselves and they can collaborate, exchange some ideas. And that is the goal of the uh, institutions uh, versus, uh, versus the commercial places. And next slide, please. And this is the, uh, these are the pictures from a vivarium. And uh, this was a full uh, vivarium with uh, 13 animal holding rooms, all automated with the bottle uh, washers, uh, autoclaves. And this was also added uh, some requirements also NIH because this project was funded by NIH. So they added some other requirements. But at the end, this project finished under budget and under uh, uh, ahead of the schedule. And this was again, a great success story for all of us. Next slide. Great, thank you. And then uh, just as a final case study, I uh, just wanna talk a little bit about GenMab. Uh, again, project is 90,000 square foot fit out. You're gonna hear some common themes. It was an existing office building to lab conversion. And again, speed to market was really the driver um, on this project. Uh, here, we utilized a different strategy to hit that mark, and it was prefabrication. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, the star of this project really is the prefabricated penthouse that, that you see here, which realized a cost and schedule savings on this project. Um, you know, at our first project meeting, it was determined that we had two weeks, just two weeks, to release all of the longest lead items uh, in that penthouse in order to make our overall schedule. Um, in order to do this, we engaged Source Blue, uh, which some of you may have known previously as Turner Logistics, uh, who's our supply chain manager that leverages direct manufacturer relationships uh, to provide things like mechanical equipment, electrical equipment, lighting, and uh, moving into lab casework and, and lab equipment markets as well. Um, through competition at the manufacturer level, 
uh, instead of just at the, the subcontractor level that we typically see, uh, we were able to realize uh, uh, significant cost savings. You see there 10% on this prefabricated penthouse. Um, on this project, the vendors were able to work hand in hand with that design team to make product selections at the table and get the penthouse rele house released within that, that two week window for delivery on the site in alignment with the overall schedule. Uh, the overall schedule was nine months from that first meeting and until project turnover. Um, through, by utilizing this prefab penthouse, we were able to do a number of things. Um, the main one of which was to work simultaneously on the roof with the, the roof dunnage and, and new roofing membrane installation uh, while the penthouse was being prefabricated offsite, which was a, a tremendous, tremendously important. Um, this project without uh, prefabrication would have had all of these activities combining on the site in the middle of a, an unpredictable Northeast winter, right? So again, bringing, being engaged early on this project, uh, bringing the builder on really allowed uh, the client to, to see something with constructability, lead time, and, and, and kind of through the lens of that builder that we really like to bring that expertise to the table. On this particular project, SourceBlue was also able to, to provide some services with the procurement of lab equipment. Uh, we provided the milli cues and, and autoclaves for the for the owner, um, which were you know we were able to coordinate with the the overall project and overall schedule. So I just want to you know say thank you for for spending a few minutes with us here today and, and allowing us to share some stories on on, on these past successes. And I'm just going to turn it over to Mark uh, now. Thanks. Thanks, Dana. So, so listen, just as a quick summary, I know this is the NYC bio bills, but just from a New Jersey perspective, I think if you were talking to virtually any developer in the state of New Jersey, they would tell you the struggles and how difficult it is to get through the approval and permitting process and, and, and how many deals um, can't happen or delay just, just because of, you know, the, the, the length of time it takes. I think when you couple that with the glut of, of office buildings that are available in New Jersey, both, uh, you know, your regular office buildings, plus so many uh, pharmaceutical uh, buildings that have been uh, uh, left behind. Um, you're seeing this ability for a lot of these firms to look at these existing buildings, right? They've really become prime opportunities uh, for for these uh, uh, firms to really get that speed to market. You heard Jim Folger say that earlier, speed to market was all about for, for uh, a lot of these uh, uh, firms, right? And they don't have two years to wait to go through a, a zoning process, to go through an approval and permitting process, right? Uh, you got to go through design, build it, and validate the space. You know, if you wait two years to do that, some of these firms are going to be behind the eight ball before they can even start. Um, you know, and, and I think the most amazing thing, if you look at some of these projects, um, in New Jersey, where it's always been home to big pharma, you know, you, you're used to seeing firms like uh, uh, Novartis or J&J, Bristol-Myers Squibb or Pfizer. A lot of these firms we're talking about here today, um, they're not those firms. These are smaller firms, they're startup firms, they're maybe even spinoffs of some of the large companies, right? And, and frequently they have new technologies like CAR-T therapy that, that they need to get into the marketplace immediately, right? I mean, you know, quick enough isn't quick enough is, is what they almost tell us. So, you know, I think I think it's it's something where uh, we've been able to uh, work with many of these firms. Like Dana said, you look at the uh, cellular job. We weren't just in for the design build. We were in for the building selection, which is rare as a builder, right? That's usually uh, the brokers or the developers looking at that part of the deal. So, um, you know, we've had great opportunities, and 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 I think. Um, you know, that'll continue in, 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 in really, I think the whole Northeast corridor for the foreseeable future, because, uh, you know, I don't think there's any firm out there that's not, that doesn't have the word life science on the tip of their tongue. So, um, you know, appreciate your time today. Thank you. Great, is that uh, the last speaker from Turner? Yes, it is, Nancy. Um, oh. I have questions. If they want to chat them in, we can. Um, yeah, no, thanks, Charlie. Uh, we'll be going into our chat rooms in a moment, but um, just wanted to remind everyone that's on the line right now that this is part of an on ongoing series of online events that's hosted by NYC Builds Bio, and you can view those uh, upcoming events on the website and also register for future monthly webinars, which will feature one of our members. 
um, each month. And I especially want to highlight an upcoming program scheduled for Thursday, May 6th from 1 to 2.30, which will showcase a case study on the pioneering lease between the Georgetown Company and the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai for 165,000 square feet in a mixed use conversion development. It's a very um, unique transaction and really demonstrates the breadth of uh, value for a number of industries when a life science transaction of that magnitude gets put together. So uh, we'll be looking at why that is so pioneering for the New York market. But another way to get involved uh, with NYC Builds Bio is to join a leadership committee. And I want to invite the chairs of the leadership committees that are with us this afternoon, and I don't think everyone is, um, to talk about their agendas and, and what the meetings that they've been having. Um, so we basically have um, several leadership committees, planning and membership development, academic medical institutions, healthcare, life sciences, New York City life science subclusters, and regulatory. Um, and I, I know that we've got some of the chairs on the call today. So um, Bill Brody, who's the business development manager from Hennigan Construction, and Laura Gallo, who's the director of marketing, uh, brand and growth for Group PMX, co-chair our planning uh, and membership development committee. So do you want to say a few words about your plans, Bill and Laura? Sure. 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 L Laura, would you like to take it? Sure, sure. Thanks, Bill. Thank okay. you, Nancy. Okay. Um, well, our planning and membership committee has a two-pronged mission. On the one hand, to help organize NYC Builds Bio activities and identify issues of concern to the life sciences community. And on the other, to support members and expand membership and services. Um, but with the impressive work that Nancy has already done in lining up a very dynamic program of events for 2021, our committee's focus has been on membership. Um, we have a very impressive group of professionals as part of our committee. A uh, special shout out to Turner's Lisa Hickerson. Um, and they're all engaged and enthusiastic about NYC Builds Bio informational and networking events and about promoting the organization and the benefits of membership. As we all know, we've heard um, the life sciences market is fast growing in New York and across the country. And um, we believe that NYC Builds Bio should be growing with it. We held our first meeting on March 2nd and had a very uh, energetic conversation, shared ideas, identified strategies for building membership, which we've begun to execute. And we have a meeting coming up on May 4th and we will be looking to uh, have those uh, monthly meetings thereafter and we'll be executing on the strategies we've already discussed, identifying others and tracking our progress against them. Um, if anyone is interested in an opportunity to help build the future of NYC Builds Bio, this is the place to be, um, the Planning and Membership Committee. We invite you to uh, join us um, on May 4th and reach out to Bill, Nancy, or me um, if, if you're interested. Bill, do you have anything to add? I think you did a wonderful job, Laura. That's wonderful. Um, we are really just picking up speed now, and uh, there's a lot to uh, to communicate to people out there about the the uh, exciting things that are happening at New York City. New York City builds bio, so uh, I look forward to uh, working with anybody who wants to join us um, in growing this great organization. Terrific, and we really thank you for your service. For most of you, um, obviously last year was a fairly uneven year. Uh, people were busy and challenged in many, many ways. And so our leadership committees are just kind of getting reorganized and relaunched this year. And so uh, Bill and Laura are two new co-chairs for this committee and we're really glad that they stepped up to take that leadership position. We also have um, a leadership committee on academic medical institutions, which is chaired by Charlie Murphy, who's an associate at JB&B. 
He's not with us today due to a work assignment, but um, we'll have him catch you up at another meeting. Um, and our healthcare uh, leadership committee is co-chaired by Joe Bellano, managing director and regional healthcare and life science uh, sector leader um, at the Collier's Project Leaders and uh, Rose Novak, a senior associate at Gensler. And Joe couldn't be with us today, but I think Rose is to give us an update. Hi everyone, thanks Nancy. Yeah, Joe un unfortunately couldn't be on today, but um, he said to say hello to everybody. Um, the healthcare committee has, has remained really active during the last year, during the pandemic. We've met monthly. Uh, it's been a great source of connection uh, for all of us on the committee to really be engaged throughout, throughout this whole um, pandemic and, and throughout this whole crisis uh, to be able to really bounce ideas off of each other and understand what's going on throughout the industry uh, during this time. Um, we've just expanded our committee to, we have a couple of new members. Uh, we met last month and we're gonna be meeting again next Tuesday. We meet um, once a month on Tuesdays at 9 a.m. Um, if anybody else is interested in joining uh, our group. Um, we've, we have a really great cross-section of professionals from a lot of different parts of this industry and um, it's a really dynamic group. Um, our mission statement, which we developed last year is uh, what drives healthcare systems to invest in research and what are the obstacles they're facing? Uh, we feel that's still valid now, um, although the events that we're gonna focus on planning in, in the near future, we think is gonna have a lot of inclusion about how things have changed throughout the last year and how some of the healthcare delivery methods have, may, have changed and what type of impact that might be on the spaces that they're building. Um, our goal for the next year, and this is one of the things we wanted to do last year, but um, never came to fruition because of all that was going on, is to plan um, a series of small focus types of fireside chat um, events, either virtual or hopefully in person one of these days soon. Um, we, we'd like to meet um, and align more with the life sciences and higher education subcommittees because we think there's a lot of overlap in the terms types of things that we're doing. And we really want to focus on topics that are especially relevant to this group, um, you know, real estate architecture, construction, engineering, uh, to really bring to you the discussion points that will be valid in what you do professionally and, and how we can bring the most value to your um, everyday work. That's, that's our update. Terrific. Thank you, Rose. Thank you. Um, so Anthony Montaldo has to jump in a minute, but I want to introduce him, a partner at JBNB. He co-chairs the regulatory committee with Zach Bernstein, who's a partner at Freed Frank. And Anthony, if you're still with us, uh, you can talk a little bit about your work. Well, here, Nancy, thank you very much. And good afternoon, everyone. Great to see everyone today. So regulatory committee, uh, we've met you know, a couple of times this year, earlier this year, and then as recent as this past Tuesday. Nancy, thank you for joining us on that meeting. Uh, really engaging meeting this past Tuesday with the EDC. And mostly we're just trying to figure out what's happening with the city. Um, there will be some potential changes at the end of this year with the mayoral administration and really understanding where potential funding is going with regulatory. Um, the other thing we're working on with our committee is trying to bring more, I guess, sanity and clearness to regulatory zoning for life science buildings within New York. We know it can be very complex. So we plan to bring more transparency to that kind of process to our organization and our members. Um, you know, laboratory buildings can be complex with the many different types of life safety systems. So we wanna make sure that, you know, all the developers that are looking at repositioning their buildings understand those complex systems. So if there's anyone interested in joining our committee, we're always looking for new members. Just let me know or let Nancy know. Terrific. Thanks, Anthony, so much for your leadership uh, and Zach for your his leadership on that committee. Um, Life Sciences. Uh, this is a very active committee co-chaired by Chris Horch, who's associate partner at JBNB, and uh, Joseph Del Pozo, senior vice president of WSP. And Chris, uh, I, there's a question here from Nimi Vashi. How do postdocs in academia and building spinoff companies uh, be a part and contribute? And I know that's what your committee is working very hard on. <clears throat> so maybe you can answer that question. What a, what a leading question. I know. Um, so good afternoon, all. Thank you for taking the time. And you know, Rose probably has said it best about what the committees really do and how they operate. So I'm not going to 
um, you know, jump on her her great speech here. But you know, from the life science committee side of things, you know, we we started meeting last year, had a had a hiatus for uh, COVID, and then came back a couple of months ago and decided to completely revamp what our mission statement was going to be. You know, originally we were looking at the built environment, how to reposition buildings and things of that nature. And we've really taken a step back and said, what is, what is New York City, what do the surrounding areas need in terms of a life science committee? And we're taking a two-pronged approach at this point. And it's really about outreach to the community at large from both a tenant or incubator and coming out in that step out space and that next step out and a developer and really helping developers understand what their assets are today and if there is an ability for them to reposition them tomorrow. So with that being said, you know, part of our mission statement with our committee is putting together a couple of one pagers and flyers, both from a tenant perspective and from a developer perspective and saying, hey, here are the things that you need to look out for. Here's a you know, kind of a roadmap to get you from your, your bench top to a step out space to the next level um, and helping uh, from a tenant perspective there. And then a developer saying, okay, if you have an existing asset or a potential asset, here are the bare bones. Here's what you, know, you, could, you could use as a kind of a, a roadmap to say, would my asset potentially be a good conversion for life sciences or at least to have a, a next step look at it? Um, and those are going to be released in the next month, month and a half or so. Um, and that's, that's really been the focus from the committee. And then in part with that, the next steps are going to be either short videos or additional outreach in terms of really defining what those, um, you know, those, those steps are in order to get into the next building and really building this life science community from a you know, a, a clustering perspective and building perspective and, and really trying to build from there. But we have a great committee. We're, we're gaining members every single month. It's been a great communication and we seem to be have settled into a, a little bit of a banter. And yes, two engineers are running this committee, but it's okay. We have personalities and we'll, we, we assure you that we don't take up all of the time um, talking about engineering speak. Um, so it, it's just, it's been a lot of fun and, and we're really looking forward to the back half of this year. Great. Thank you, Chris. And just getting back to that introductory question, um, you know, one of the summaries that you're putting together is really a how to for a postdoc or a founder of, in, of a biotech company that's in one of the incubators, all of the steps that they need to think about in terms of getting out of that incubator and establishing their own operations and having postdocs or startups involved in that process or in that committee would be really invaluable, right? Absolutely. And you know, we're looking for those, you know, those people to help guide us because we're doing it from our perspective, but having a postdoc or two that is going through the process or has just gone through the process would really be helpful as we hone in on this step-by-step -step process of getting out of that postdoc and into a step out space or incubator and then growing a company out of that um, science. Terrific. Well, thanks to you and to uh, Joe for co-chairing this committee. You're doing great work. And I saw your flyers and I think they're gonna be a real, a real value to the community. Thank you. Um, we've also got a New York City Life Science Real Estate Subcluster Committee. I don't see either uh, Sarah Epifano from, who's a vice president at Skanska or Tim Sanders, a senior investment officer at Ventas on our participation list right now. Um, so uh, if you're interested in joining that, you can get in touch with me and I'm happy to make an introduction. Uh, we've also got um, Peter Schubert from ENIAD who is uh, also chairing um, a portion of the city where those subclusters are developing. So uh, we thank them for their service. They've been hard at work as well. And, um, and again, thank you, Turner, for just a great presentation today, which I know everybody really benefited from. So now um, I'm going to ask uh, Carolina from the Berman Group to put us all into our